Thanks very much, everyone, for coming. Me and other members of staff here are members of the Sonic Research Group, and we wanted to invite the great Andy Lemon to come <laughs> and present his practice based research, his work, and um, his musical and artistic practice for us. You probably know Andy as course director of the Game Design and Development degree, and also as a game designer, sound designer, um, composer, musician, um, man of many, many talents. And he's going to talk to us today about Diffused, made with Asobi Tech. So we're going to get to listen to some of the music and sound design and I guess hear something about your creative process behind it. Yeah. So thanks very much for, for joining and talking to us today, Andy. Um, thank you. Thank you so right, so today I'm going to be talking about producing new music for a Game Boy game, but in current times. And weirdly enough, back in the mid-90s when I started working in the games industry, I started out on the Game Boy, on the green screen Game Boy, so this is like going full circle, doing a new like puzzle game with players diffusing bombs, avoiding obstacles and hazards during yeah. gameplay. Each set of the worlds in the game, which are made up of levels, um, is set in its own unique environment. And, um, so it's split up into different worlds, and one of the worlds is a beach area, another one's a castle, we've got a jungle level, a factory level, a volcano and a fortress. And in addition to the game's worlds, Cutscenes are interspersed into the action to transition the player into these new spaces, driving the story forward alongside sundry music, playing the game in front of the game, and menu screens and continue screens. So next up, I'm just going to show you a bit of footage of the gameplay that Quang uh, captured for us, and just to give you an idea of what it looks like in situ on a Game Boy. So this is actually running on an actual Game Boy or a cartridge. music. It's got a very charming intro screen where you, you select your menu options and you can fall off the edge of the selection which I think is very good. Here's a cutscene. adds to the number of the bombs and you have to collect things in the correct order and avoid explaining yourself. And if you don't just use the bombs, you don't get energy as well. There's lots of things that carry on in this challenge. <laughs> so sound, how does sound on the Game Boy work? Well you've got four channels of audio. And that's PSG audio, that's a programmable sound generator that allows you to set various functions. But you've only got four channels, so you can only do four things at once. Uh, when you think a chord is generally three notes or four notes, you understand how, how it can be quite difficult to compose music on such limited um, hardware. Um, you've also got a waveform and synthesis locked to channel type, so and you can't mix and match that within the Game Boy in the same way. So the first channel of the Game Boy is a pulse square wave channel with pitch and envelope control. The second channel is pulse square wave and no built-in pitch envelope control. And the third channel on the Game Boy is 32 bytes count them of sample memory. So if you imagine 32 bytes is literally the topic size of your average email, that is how big the sample size on the Game Boy is. Um, and you have to be very, very creative if you're working with samples on the Game Boy, because they're technically uh, single cycle waveforms, and you have to set each byte at a certain position 
in the low pressure and high pressure area of the waveform to create any sound at all. And you can abuse the way that works to make interesting sounds, which you'll hear in the soundtrack. But uh, it's not designed to play longer than 32 bytes as standard, the Game Boy. And you also have noise generation on the fourth channel of the machine. The Game Boy itself is stereo out of the headphone jack, but only has one speaker built into the unit. So when you're designing music for the Game Boy, a lot of music for the Game Boy was essentially mono. Our replay that we're using, which we're going to talk about in a minute, is generally mono. Um, cool. So. Forward. So fine control, what can you do with fine control on the Game Boy with sound? Channel 1 and 2 allows us to control pulse width of the square wave from a selection of four positions and control volume envelopes. Channel 3 allows us to switch waveforms on the fly, with each being a single cycle 32-bit byte waveform. And Channel 4 generally allows us to pick from two noise generation settings, one suitable for more um, noise-based, general noise, white noise-based sound generations. It's great for hi-hats and snares, but also you have another algorithm that lets you do metallic sounds, and metallic sounds are fun. Because <laughs> again, we can use them for our evil you know, aims in creating interesting noises in the system, but perhaps it wasn't originally envisioned they would be used for. So quick note on tracking versus traditional sequencing. Tracking is a method for note input organization and structure of sounds and instruments and blocks of sonic material that originated on the Commodore 64, grew on the Commodore Amiga with tools like ProTracker and Optimate, and also got an early start on the PC with tools like Fast Tracker, Screen Tracker and Impulse Tracker. The great thing about trackers is it's a very easy way to reuse blocks of data, even channel info, channel info to channel info, and this makes it an ideal way to compose for low memory or low speed devices, hence it's heavy use in early console game development, right up to the Nintendo Wii era of console gaming. So a lot of the games you were playing on the Nintendo Wii, even though it's a more modern console, I wouldn't class it as retro quite yet, um, were actually tracker based modules, right? Um, and that's because they're very small and they're portable and encapsulated formats for music storage and playback. Uh, tracking is also um, seeing a bit of a resurgence in popularity for game composition due to its encapsulated format and tweakability for responsive audio. So to give you an idea, my pal Brendan's recently produced a, a real-time tracker system for the Unreal game engine that allows you to write music that can literally be modified on a note-by-note -note basis whilst you're playing a game. That's true responsive audio. Right? When people talk about responsive audio in modern games, at the moment they're talking about loops and using stems and mixing and transitions and having to do bridges and things in audio files. This is note per note modification that we can do in real time, which is very exciting. So there's a lot of stuff happening with tracking at the moment, that side of retro. Uh, so let's have a look at an old school tracker, just to give you an idea of how this worked back in the day. So when tracking, we insert notes down the screen rather than across with beats in the bar represented by rows on the screen. We can interrupt or modify sounds via effects which are placed adjacent to note data. This allows for fine control and tweaking of sound in real time. Effects available to us include arpeggiation, note slide, glissando, bold changes, phase control, note cut, delay, retrieve and pitch control. So let's take a look at a chip tune I did on the Amiga to illustrate this. And uh, if you like Iron Maiden, <laughs> it's an Iron Maiden tune, so let's, let's flip over to footage of that. And you can actually see the tune running. What's great about trackers as well as a teaching tool is you can literally see the song's construction as it plays in real time, which is wonderful um, to teach people about structure and music. So here's, here's a bit of Iron Maiden on the Amiga. Chip tune. <laughs>
And if I pause there, and we just hover over the screen, right, what you can see is the different channels that the Amiga has for sound. Weirdly enough, the Game Boy's got four channels as well, right? So the Amiga's got four channels for sound, which are mono in nature. Uh, each, of these, each of these channels represents one part of the song. Right? We can isolate any of these channels at any time, we can modify them, we can insert notes into them. It's actually a very clever way of storing music. You can see all the note data, so if you download a module uh, that someone's composed, not only do you get all the note data, you get all the sample data as well, and you can see how they constructed the sounds themselves for the music that they produced, which again is very uncommon in music storage. So, just play a little bit more because there's a bit where it shows off the new capabilities of track. <laughs> idea of where tracking kind of came from and what it grew into. Um, so a quick potted history of game music routines on the Game Boy. Um, music routines or replays as we used to call them are standalone code bases facilitating playback of music and often sound effects either created in a cross-platform editor like the one on the right there on the screen or programmed directly into Z80 machine code on the Game Boy for game development. Uh, there were plenty of these available back in the day, commercial routines um, on the system. So examples include uh, GHX by Shenen Multimedia, P5 Tracker, which is the thing over there on the right, uh, Carillion Tracker, and MuseX were great examples of licensed sound routines, replays, that were used in commercial software. So this is a commercial solution for producing Game Boy Audio that I helped with back in the day um, by my pals at Paragon 5. This is one of the demonstration tunes that shipped with the software back in the late 90s to developers that wanted to do music production in their games. Uh, so the key factor in a replay was speed. The ability to play that interesting sound without too much cost to the CPU of the target machine you were producing audio. So we're going to have a quick look at um, Paragon 5 Tracker to give you an idea of what we used to work with back in the day. So here's, here's a bit of music from me from 1990. And this was a demonstration tool shared between software to teach people how to use. And again, you can see all the notes and how it's constructed for different sounds. <laughs> so you get, get an idea. Um, basically, if we pause that there and we look at the different channels, this is um, our pulse wave channel here. So square and pulse wave, square and pulse wave, sample channel, very small 32 byte samples, and our noise channel for noise synthesis there on the fourth channel. Uh, and the other thing just to discuss quickly is you might have heard of Little Sound DJ, which is a cartridge that you can plug into your Game Boy and write music on the go. Um, very important to mention that Little Sound DJ is not a tool that one could use very easily for game audio production. There's a good reason for that that I'll go into now. So you might have come across LSDJ and the media and stuff. It's a great bit of software to use on the go for producing chip tunes, but it's wholly unsuitable for video game production as its advanced sound routines, including chaining tiny samples together, 
uh, to allow for percussive feedback of like drum kits and stuff is, is uh, not very good isn't it? because it utilizes about 100% of the CPU of the Game Boy, so there wouldn't be anything left for Fang to create a game <laughs> if we used a routine like this to play the music. It'd sound banging, but there wouldn't be a game there. Um, so so it's, it's a lovely piece of software to use though, really, really well designed, beautiful user friendliness when you get into it, it's very, very, very worth getting a copy of it if you have a Game Boy lying around. So what's new in terms of um, tools? So over the last 20 years we've seen big developments in Game Boy sound tools including revisits to old source code like my pal Bob's updating of the Paragon Boy sound replay for the homebrew community. Um, or entirely new Game Boy music capable tools like Huge Tracker and Deflamask becoming available. If you've not seen Deflamask, it's a piece of software that you can pay for that allows you to track music for various console systems. So you could write PC Engine music on it, Master System music. Um, it's got a Neo Geo FM MVS drive. You could write FM Mega Drive music on it. You can also write Game Boy tunes in it too. Um, for our game project, we went with the very recently released um, and updated huge tracker for the Game Boy, as its replay is rather fast and feature complete in terms of instrument design and effect capabilities. So let's have a quick look at um, huge tracker running. Now, while this is running, I want you all to pay attention to any missed notes that you hear or any glitches that you hear in the replay while the video is running. And then when we listen to the album and you hear the tune again, and you hear what it sounds like on a real Game Boy, remember the missed material. Because <laughs> this is another very important part of creating music on older systems, is uh, being mindful that the hardware behaves in a very different way to the software. Uh, so here's Beach for Diffused. So this is the software. <laughs> And we just look at the different sections of the track, I'll explain what they do. This area here is your arrangement window. This is where you're arranging the different blocks of the song and how they complement and correspond to each other. The reason that we're using something like Huge is that we're able to reuse a lot of data in order to facilitate the construction of the song. That saves a huge amount of memory and increases the speed of the replay routine and it gives Quang more memory to play with in terms of graphic updates and effects and visual representation in the software. Um, the way that we do that on these sorts of pieces of software is that we can reuse channel data in multiple patterns. So what we're looking at here is a pattern, but what we're actually seeing is channel data zero being repeated all the way through the song. Because I'm using the same chord progression and arpeggiation on every single pattern of the song. So we only have to store that bit of data once, and we just call it again and again when we need it. Whereas with modern composition, you, you'd have to separate those things out into stems and loops and repeat the loops, right? But we're doing this all in real time. If we look over here in the section of the tune that's responsible for, for the lead and the melody, you can see there's a lot more variation. But if we look at the WAV channel, which is repeating the same pulsing, octave shifting bass line, you can see again, it's repeated all the way through the song, as is the noise channel, which is doing the <laughs> beat, right? Um, I'm also doing something else that's fun in this one, which is abusing the, um, the speed command to give the song shuffle. So on every line, I'm moving the speed up and down between two values to make it go like this. <laughs> right? So. <laughs> Thing worth noting is the player doesn't see or understand any of this and that's not important. 
it's not important for the player to understand this, but it is important for the creator to understand how to structure their material effectively so they can facilitate the production of well-working games on lower memory and lower CPU power machines. So this is my little ethos, my sonic ethos for the project, with a lovely um, picture of the team here um, that Lucan did. Um, you can see me at the top there, and uh, Quang's in the middle. Uh, so my main thing was theme all the world background music to their settings in a diverse range of styles. So variety was key. The idea behind the soundtrack was to give every world that you inhabited a really strong individual sense of space, right? Um, which a lot of Game Boy games didn't really do. Like back in the day, they'd have a central theme or a style of music that ran through the entire game without interruption. Um, give clear thematic build-up in the compositions, changing tone and style as the journey of the character moved forward in the game world. Also tribute some of the soundtracks from my early video game days, some of the people I rate, some of them don't get talked enough about. And uh, I like to sort of, you know, give them a little bit of a nudge, you know, maybe tribute them a little bit. Uh, only composers are going to notice that, players will probably wouldn't notice it. And, and also break lots of extremely sensible rules that Nintendo set for audio in their approved titles. So something that people don't, again, talk about a lot is the fact that back in the day, if you made games for Nintendo, they had to go through an approval process. And if you didn't follow their guidelines, you would fail the approval process and you would have to resubmit your game. That could delay the release date of the game. It could delay the marketing of the game. And there are lots of things that I do in the soundtrack that Nintendo are like, don't do that. Back in the day, you mustn't do that. <laughs> Get into that in a little bit. There we go. So that's me at the top, Andy. That's Lucan, we did the art, that's Quang sitting over there with the code, and Kay is our producer on this one. Cool. So some techniques for instrument design that I utilised in the project. So things like shifting the pulse of channel 1 and channel 2 square wave settings over time. If you don't know what that means, it's basically the difference between a sound that sounds pure, like this, and a sound that sounds like this. <laughs> and the idea is shifting the pulse of a channel is you're sweeping across different um, tonalities and that gives you some really interesting effects within the music. It stops things from sounding too monotonous, uh, especially when you're dealing with very simple waveforms. Another thing that we did a lot in the soundtrack was cycling waveform data on channel three, so the sample channel in creative ways like bending it to our whim, you know, faking things like filtering, faking things like um, octave changes by using specific <coughs> size waveforms. Uh, tonal instruments on the Channel 4 noise channel, which Nintendo is very much against back in the day. I got told off multiple times in the late 90s and early 2000s for putting tonal elements on the noise channel because people said it wouldn't get through um, the approval process. So that's, that's my <laughs> obey Nintendo sound guidelines, finally do what you want. So we don't have to worry about going through Nintendo's process because we're publishing the game and that was just life action. Yeah. Um, cool. So some other techniques that we use, like percussive tricks on channel two, so faking envelope pitch control on a channel where it doesn't actually have envelope pitch control through creative use of effects. Um, volume effects on mixed instruments on multiple channels. Tailing sounds using multiple instruments to fake a longer sound with multiple parts. Um, little Easter eggs I put in the soundtrack that you can only hear if you hear it on headphones. You know, putting instruments at very low volume or little parts of the sound at low volume. So when you plug a headphone set in, you're like, oh, there's an extra bit in the song. Or, oh, there's a little extra feature. Uh, experimenting <coughs> with partial phase cancellation of pulse um, and square wave channels. And that's really fun because we've got mirrored pulse widths on the Game Boy. So we can put those things slightly offset and create other sounds by like messing with the phase cancellation. It's partial because it won't be inaudible. It'll just make the Game Boy go, <gasps> which again, Nintendo would hate me doing. Uh, setting the volume of waveform channel can also yield interesting sonic effects depending on the source waveform shape. So you can do um, resin cutoff sound. So if you saw Deef die in that segment, that's actually me playing with setting the volume of the wave channel to create a very interesting effect on the Game Boy, which again, not many people actually would have heard before, which is nice. And also, bass. Yeah. Very important. <laughs> a lot of people think the Game Boy doesn't have bass. It's lies. You've just got to hit it quite hard. 
So we're going to have a listen to the album now. We're just going to listen to the thing through because it's 20 minutes. I hope that doesn't bother anyone. You're all trapped. <laughs> 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 so this is this is the album. So this is um, the master data for the CD that's been produced for the limited edition of the release title. And it's set up to play you all the level soundtracks first, then all the cut scenes, and then all the front and back of house data, like you know, the title screen, back end screens, etc. So let's have a listen. So this is this is starting off. Now we have down the beach. My, my homage to early 90s holidays in Greece.
very silly way to tell it. Right, 
So this is an outside of gameplay. This is the continued tune. I'm kind of name checking Jonathan Dunn in this one. I'm also misusing the Lewis Chandler again to get an extra bit of tune and tonality out of it. So it's about how long you can stay alive. The whole point of this tune is to mess with the player by making it more and more manic as the tune progresses and adding more and more distraction. So this is three and a half minutes of like just trying to do a banger. <laughs> Yeah. 
Again, coming up is the is the hoist score tune. BGM, which is the title screen, that's me tributing with that title older Japanese soundtrack albums because that's the sort of thing they call their title screen music. <laughs> Is the uh, the you know you've completed the game well done, which is always a you know a very jolly experience. It's quite a sweet uh, sort of jolly experience. So <laughs> Messing with the, uh, the the volume of waveforms to create fake uh, resonance. And there are lots of other considerations that you have to think about when working on a system like the Game Boy. 
So testing with multiple models of the Game Boy is one thing. Um, you cannot trust the emulated output of your cross-development tools over testing on real hardware. And as we heard when I showed you a video of the cross-development tracker, you know, notes might miss, tempo might miss fire, you might hear missing note entry data. If we don't take the music across to our target device, the actual hardware, and actually listen to it and monitor it, um, we're not getting a good representation in most software of what the real machine is going to do, how it will behave. Certain things that you can do on emulated versions of sound chips that sound fantastic will be completely inaudible on hardware. Right? So it's very important to understand that. It's very important to test anything that we're doing um, on the machine itself. Additionally, each individual Game Boy model has its own sonic characteristics, so testing on multiple devices is really, really important. So here's a few devices I tested on when I was doing music on the system. The, a Game Boy original model with the original green screen, an original model with an Ips modded screen, which is the backlit display um, that have come out recently. Um, a different screen, because different Ips modded screens will produce different <coughs> sounds. Um, Game Boy Pocket, a Game Boy Pocket with an Ips screen, a SNES Super Game Boy, because that runs at a different speed than the actual Game Boy. Um, a Game Boy Color with an Ips screen, a Game Boy Color with no Ips screen, a Game Boy Original Model with original screen and Pro Sound Mod, which is what we, as I'm going to talk about in a minute, used to record the sound. So for the release of the limited edition of Game Tile, an album was being produced, but what is the best way to record a Game Boy? So the Game Boy is capable of outputting a decent enough signal for its built-in headphone jack, but for optimal sound quality, several caveats exist. Um, so here's some tips. If your Game Boy is modified with an Ips backlight screen for maximum viewability, you may have a ground loop when recording or background noise created by the modification itself due to its poor isolation of you know, electronics. These things are produced in China. They don't have to follow these standards, and they do put out a lot of noise. So you could find that when you try and record your output from a device like that, you've got a constant or 50 or 60 hertz hum present in all your recordings. Uh, audio amps on the older Game Boys, so if you have one from back in the day, even if you've got one and it's unmodified, the actual amp circuit might be damaged because the capacitors have blown out because it's so old. You've got to remember these things were released early 90s, late 80s. Um, the caps are going to kill the system. And that's why so many Game Boys have very, very quiet sound, is because the, app, the caps have gone on the soundboard. So, you have to think about this too. And if the caps are gone, you'll have terrible bass response too. Your best bet is to modify a Game Boy original model with a Pro Sound modification which bypasses the onboard amp for optimum sound quality. So you just put an extra jack in that bypasses the amp and you get the sound direct from the chip um, at line level, which is a, you know, a little bit more beefy and it means you avoid the caps problem altogether. So here are a few influences on the soundtrack. So there's Alberto McAlvey, Jose Gonzalez. Now Alberto was responsible for lots of wonderful music on the Game Boy um, over the years, things like the Smurfs and various wonderful games, and he's still producing audio and working on games today. Uh, Kazuhiro Nishida, who's the chap responsible for a lot of SNK's original arcade soundtracks over the years, doesn't get enough credit, doesn't get talked to that about enough at all. There are no pictures, no photos of this guy anywhere on the internet. Um, it's really a pioneer of arcade sound and also NES sound. Um, the entire Capcom sound team, which is Kumi Yamaga, Manami, Matsube, Tamayo Kawamoto, Harumi Fujita, and Junko Tamiya, are a huge, huge influence on me doing this soundtrack. Uh, John Dunn, who's an absolutely incredible musician from back in the day, I worked on multiple platforms, really famous for doing the music to Robocop on the Game Boy that Ariston used in the on and on and on advert on the telly. And people just were like, why are they using a Game Boy tune? It just makes perfect sense. Because it, it does, it goes on, it loops. It's just very hypnotic, this music. Um, basically, all of Italo Disco, huge influence on the soundtrack, can't not name check Italo. Here's Mike Maureen to illustrate Italo. No better face. <laughs> I'm missing his golden. <laughs> Chain. Yes, nobody has that great big one <laughs> of the shapes. Uh, so Kinuyu Yamashita, that's the Canadian house composer for the original Castlevania. Uh, Chipsaw, 
get a various game board bangers and all some BGM ISTs. And Chuck Deer, public enemy for basically everything because I love him. And <laughs> basically, he's, he's one of my big heroes. But a really nice thing that Chuck said many years ago was, uh, you know, don't make the same album twice, no matter how much anyone asks you to. And that's the whole ethos of our soundtrack for this game. It's, it's not doing the same thing twice. We're trying to do variety. We're trying to do you know, themes that move and change in style throughout the gameplay experience. Uh, great. So that's my influences. People don't talk about influences now when they do these talks. I think you should always name check people you like. Well, it's like literature and DNA. Context. <laughs> <laughs> What I'm working on next. So what I'm working on next is an imaginary canned Famicom RPG soundtrack using ancient impulse tracker DOS sequencing software. So I was going to play you a little bit of that just so you can have a listen. Um, this project's um, just a self-driven project that I'm doing. And the idea is it's, it's, it's a bit silly. But basically, um, I've done this before. I've given myself an imaginary project. So an example of back in the day, I set myself a project to do an EP, which was the soundtrack to an imaginary B movie from the 70s, a post apocalyptic film called Dead Planet about an ancient dying world version of the Earth. And so I created this EP and I released it, and people were like, That's so good, you even wrote a story about the film, this film that doesn't exist. So it's exactly the same idea, but it's a game that never existed. And the whole point of the soundtrack being for the Famicom is that um, they tried, they bit off more than they could chew because they tried to create. A, uh, a synthesizer chip to enable multi-channel audio on the Famicom, and that that made the company go bust because the car was too expensive to produce. I made all this up. <laughs> I've got the whole backstory. The, the reason that I enjoy um, enjoy working in these old pieces of software is a lot of the time people say that um, lack of money is a barrier to creativity on computers, and you know lack of money. Is, it's rubbish. You can make something sound good. It doesn't matter what you use if you just put the time and effort in. You know, just especially old software like this. Actually, quite powerful system for writing music. It's got real-time filter control built into it. You can do all sorts of exciting things. So this is just a bit of, of the new thing that I do. about this old software is you can see all the notes at the top there. Those little dots are all individual notes. You can also see all the notes at the bottom of the screen. This will be the part in the game where you're panning up a massive tree at the start of the RPG. You go up, up into the sky and the logo is just about to appear. <laughs> Again, just don't, you know, not getting stuck in any particular um, style or anything as you're producing material. So that's about it. Has anyone got any questions? We'll stick the light back on so folks can see stuff. Is that the end of the stuff? Cool. So any questions? Well, it still doesn't have the bass speaker, so yeah. you know, that's how people wouldn't really consider yeah. 
through the program. Oh, you can program. still hear this on the real Game Boy. You can? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I, I, did, Cause I, was I designed thinking, it to be audible. Because <laughs> you're making it for two, two different ways of playing it. Yeah, on the yeah. one hand, this uh, mono and mm. on the Game Boy, and on the other hand, it's yeah. stereo and yeah. the headphones. Yeah. Where, of course, the bass would be more... It's much more prominent. It's a oh, bit yeah, like yeah. Um, you can hide like elements of the compositions that won't be so audible on the Game Boy speaker, but when you plug the headphones in, because they're so close to your ears, mm -hmm. like the volume means that you perceive it in a different way. So there's yeah. lots and lots of percussive elements in those songs. We can hear it more in the room because mm. we're playing at a really high volume. Um, but if you play it on the handheld, you're still getting a really nice sense of the music. Mm. But when you plug the headphones in, it's like, wow, the world's opened up. Yeah, um, so more. those high frequency thingamajigs, are they yeah. from the noise channel? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they're really awesome. So, so that's, that's really misusing the noise channel in a way that is really not wasn't intended to be used in that way. I mean, they really, really did not like people using it for that reason nice. <laughs> because they did. They thought it was um, it would be distracting, but also I think they worried that between the different revisions of the machine, mm -hmm. um, you would have problems with that being replicated correctly. Oh, to translate it into the yeah. next version. Yeah. Yeah. Because we've got so many different versions of the game. Question: When you're making the songs, like, you know, you make the song in logic. Yeah. I see the notes that you put on. Yeah. And the various things, just like the numbers. Yeah. How so the notes are, are named. So so the, the notes that you see in Logic are, are just showing you the pitch like up and down the screen. Mm -hmm. You know. So actually, it's easier to read notation in that way because you can see the note names. So you could literally see it as an E, D, C, a sharp. Or, well, you, you don't necessarily see flats in the same way in track and notation. But really, you don't see flats in the same way in logic either. To be frank, like it's not a very good way of displaying no entry systems. In many ways, it's how you, it's which way you're going in terms of that. That's what you use. <laughs> yeah. I mean, clearly, you've been using it for decades almost. Like, but also, like, I'm very comfortable sequencing in a normal sequence as yeah. well because we we all had Cubase back in the day on even crappy old machines like the ST. You know, like so, wonderful machine. Uh, for sound, um, really nice audio chip, um, but it wasn't it wasn't powerful. But I tell you what, it held its tempo better than most of these newfangled things. How, how did you, you when you talk about abusing the noise channel? Yeah. How how is it that you do that? Do you have like controls over fil some kind of filtering on it, or what? No. How is it you get those different pitches? Well, the different different pitches are all about how you. Um, how you talk to the routine that's generating the noise generation on that channel. So in huge tracking, you can actually do um, envelope um, motions on numbers. So you can say, I want to be 24 points above where I've hit the note at this point. And very quickly, I want to move down X number of points on a pitch. And, and you can actually use that. You can actually move between two pitches very quickly to create a modulation that doesn't naturally occur. You could do um, things like, you know, a very high pitch starts the sound, a very low pitch shift, and the system will get confused and create a tone because of that as well. So you're kind of misusing the, the way that you can send data to the synthesis parameters in order to get really interesting effects mm. out of it. Are there other in-game sound effects? Um, no, it's very much, this game's very much more about the music. Like you know, the sound effects themselves. Um, like if we'd have gone with a totally different replay, we could have implemented that. But really, the thrust of this game is about listening to the tune, and letting the tune kind of guide you through gameplay, isn't it, Frank? I mean, that's our, our decision, you know, design decision. We're talking about the audio for the game. Um, there's a lot of Game Boy games uh, out there, and there's not. I, I don't think there's a lot of Game Boy games that sound like this game. That's kind of what we were trying to do, is do something that was very different to what people had picked before um, when working, um, what for, when playing Game Boy games. Because Game Boy, generally, music for Game Boy games is relatively simplistic, especially older Game Boy titles. I mean, you, you talked about some of the motivations for producing this kind of work. Yeah. Using old machines, yeah. and old software. Yeah. Is there also a kind of ecological or environmental? Well, it's a lot more green, isn't it? Because you're not consuming new material. I mean, you could get a very old computer, like a, you know, a Pentium or something, 
and you know be able to write music like this you know with that that's, effort. that's for sure but just wondering if it's in your in your mind when you're i like the idea of reusing and modifying old stuff and uh, also not just constantly purchasing new kit for no reason i've got lots of friends that are very very addicted to buying modules for their modular synthesizers and they don't like new music they just buy modules and they put them together and they put them in their box and then they go i need music with it you're like why are you not just fucking write some music i don't know just draw a waveform right write some music i love making modular kit and making effects but i do less of it these days because a lot of the stuff with the with this material is actually more fun to work with because you know the limits that they put on you uh, pushes you in a different creative direction I've got whole orchestra libraries and I for sure could write orchestral music for people if they want this is way harder <laughs> what are the most difficult things you find might get tough for a Game Boy then I think well, writing stuff for the Game Boy the, the hardest thing that you'll come across is the limitation in note data you know it's like writing C64 music and you've only got three things you can do at once and you have to work with mixing waveforms in order to assist you with the compositional process but on the Game Boy the, the issue is that you can't really mix waveforms in the same channel you know unless somebody writes a whole new system of creating music for it and um, channels are locked to sound type and it's the same with the Nintendo as well the first two channels are square wave the third channel is a triangle fourth channel is noise and the fifth channel is uh, you know, very simple four bit or one bit sample data on the NES. But on the NES you've got five things you can do at once. And those five things buys you a lot of creative space in terms of how you compose. Um, on the Game Boy you're further limited. The Game Boy is much more similar to working on the C64 um, than a lot of other sound chips. Um, but the thing that makes the Game Boy fun is again, the limitations make you think in a different way, right? Uh, it's a bit like the difference between writing a piece of music for a quartet versus writing a piece of music for a full orchestra. You've got to think about voicing, placement, you know, tonal range, where, where those piece, where those um, particular pieces of music are going to sit, you know, between um, a piccolo versus a trumpet, right? And also where they sit within the orchestra. That's another thing you've got to think about when you're writing. So it's a very different experience writing for limited systems. Um, but also, I'm anti the thing that happens a lot in video games, which is if it's not on an orchestra, it's not music, or my music will only be real music when an orchestra plays it. I think that's so limiting and daft, because look at all the wonderful music that's come out of things like Tangerine Dream. I mean, I'm sure there's lots of people that only listen to Tangerine Dream if it's played by an orchestra, but it ain't the same thing no. as listening to Tangerine exactly. Dream from the 70s, played <laughs> on a synth, or Kraftwerk, yeah? Played played by an orchestra. It, it doesn't you don't need that validation, it's about it doesn't sound good. Exactly. It feels like it's a it's still a problem in so much electronic music yeah. and if my heart sinks when I hear that yeah. such a body is working with an orchestra yeah. or we've got a live drummer in, we don't yeah. need the eight or eight anymore. <laughs> and what you said then, it, like, it reminds me of um, uh, like, uh, talking about the difference of composing for different instruments of the orchestra. It feels like, you know, uh, idiomatic composition, or, or but the Game Boy has this repertoire mm. of, um, of pieces that you're, that you're adding to this. Yeah, that's the thing as well. Like, every piece of old technology has its own personality, right, when it comes to like its voicing. So if you look at an 808, but the personality of an 808 is kind of it's kind of sexy. It's got you know if you look at the kick on an 808, it just goes. <laughs> it's got a vibe to it, right? It's got a personality. If you look at something like a Game Boy, it's angular, it's square, right? It's got punch. If you mess around with it, you can make it sound soft. But out of the box, it's 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 like a razor, yeah. right? <laughs> and that's that's why in the demo scene. We've got, we've got a term, we call it the chip sickness. That's when you've been listening to chip tunes for too long and you go, oh, it's a bit much. <laughs> and it's called the chip sickness. So we've got, literally got a term for it because uh, you, know, you get you know, fatigue from certain types of um, square wave based audio. But I kind of like that as punk. You know, I like the idea of making the audience sick by forcing them to listen to a whole album of square wave generated music. <laughs> uh, any other questions? 
Well, you present, I don't know if, if I'm correct, but is this presented as a research seminar? So in that case, if so, where do you feel your research resides? Is it in, um, in the archaeological aspect of how far can you push the old kit, or is it in particular compositional this processes? This is about pushing the kit, this one. It's about taking an old piece of hardware and injecting a new sound into it that's not really present. And I don't think a lot of Game Boy music sounds like this. There's a lot of music in the chip scene that's incredible. It's done on machines like the NES and the Game Boy, but not in the game space. And because when you're doing stuff and you're taking all the power of the machine, uh, you can do all sorts of crazy things. Like you can run a track 16 or 17 times faster than you could do in a game environment and create amazing sounds by just alternating between two um, instruments, you know, because it's going so quickly, it will sound like it's modulating the sound. Um, but we can't do that in a game context, right? We, got to sit and work within the limitations of the replay and the game that's being created. Like we were doing a, a beat em up on the, on the Game Boy, that'd be a lot of fun to do. We'd approach it in a different way again. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is a puzzle game and we wanted, we wanted that thematic difference between all the worlds and stages and also to give it those cutscenes, which again is a, is a thing that you don't see a lot on the Game Boy. But it's a very different product to what's come out before. You mentioned earlier about LSDJ using yeah. 100%. So you hear the stuff that people produce for LSDJ for clubs and, and, and things like that, and it's really full on. Yeah. And you don't hear that on Game Boy stuff. Mm. As you were saying before, the, the, the stuff in games is a lot more simpler mm. and it's quite square and quite angular. Mm. But the stuff you're doing here in, in this for the soundtrack is, is way above anything you would normally hear on a Game Boy game. Yeah. Uh, so that's really what this is about. It's about mm. pushing the hardware mm. and like showing off a bit, which yeah, I can't help it. <laughs> Ray showed that like a memory being used by the game and the music. Mm. Ooh, how big's the whole the whole game is two? Uh, so we have two megabytes yeah. for the cartridge, and most of that's used for sample data for the in in, in game speech, mm. which is not part of this. Yes, it's this not is, part of that. An extra thing. Yeah. Uh, the music's tiny. I deliberately made the footprint really, really small because <laughs> mm. I knew that they needed lots of space for all the other stuff. Yeah, so, so original Game Boy games were 32k before they start switching banks, but now we have two megabytes to play with, and that's tons of space yeah. for a Game Boy game. Well, you could certainly like make a game with big sample data, and you know make a four megabyte Game Boy game, which is huge for a Game Boy game and make good use of it, like for Sonics. But you've got to remember there's got to be enough time for the gameplay, um, enough CPU cycles for that gameplay to exit. Um, thanks so much. Yeah. And does anyone... Yeah. Yeah.